Hi, so this is a high yield target review for medical students or residents for abcite prep. This one is about the adrenal gland. Let's start with anatomy. The adrenal gland sits above the kidney posterior to the liver on the right side and posterior to the tail of the pancreas on the left. The left renal vein usually runs anterior to the aorta. At the level of the renal hilum from anterior to posterior, it is vein artery pelvis. The right adrenal gland has a short adrenal vein that goes directly into the IVC. The left adrenal gland has a longer adrenal vein that drains into the left renal vein. The arterial blood supply to the adrenal gland comes from three sources, superiorly from the inferior phrenic artery, medially from the aorta, inferiorly from the renal artery. The arterial blood supply comes in a stellate fashion with the anterior and posterior gland being mostly avascular. Let's look at the adrenal gland itself. The adrenal gland is made up of a cortex and a medulla. The cortex comes from the mesoderm and is stimulated by hormones and releases other hormones that are made from the base structural unit of cholesterol. The adrenal medulla comes from ectoderm neural crest cells and is stimulated by sympathetic nerves, so it acts faster than the hormonal stimulation. The adrenal medulla makes epinephrine and norepinephrine, which acts on membrane proteins, which stimulates a quicker response than adrenal hormones, which act on cytosolic receptors that move to the nucleus. Let's focus on the adrenal cortex. The adrenal cortex is broken up into three layers, the zona glomerulosa, zona fasciculata, and zona reticularis. This is GFR from outer to inner. The zona glomerulosa makes aldosterone, a mineral corticoid, which controls salt levels. The zona fasciculata makes cortisol, which is a glucocorticoid, which helps regulate sh blood sugar levels. And the zona reticularis makes sex hormones, such as the testosterone and estrogen precursors. From outer to inner, it is salt, sugar, and sex. Let's focus on the zona glomerulosa. An adrenal functional adenoma from this zone that produces aldosterone is called Kahn's syndrome. If we look at the distal convoluted tubule in the kidney, there is an exchange with the blood that reabsorbs sodium into the blood and excretes potassium and hydrogen ions into the urine. This pump is stimulated by aldosterone. High levels of aldosterone will lead to hypernatremia, hypokalemia, metabolic alkalosis, and subsequent hyper hypertension. The high levels of aldosterone from the adrenal gland leads to a negative feedback on the renin-angiotensin system. This decreases serum renin levels. So an elevated aldosterone level and a very low renal, renin level is indicative of primary hyperaldosteronism from an adrenal source. Testing for Kahn syndrome, thus is an electrolyte panel and plasma aldosterone to renin ratio, which is called the ARR ratio. Secondary hyperaldosteronism refers to something that causes high renin and thus high aldosterone, such as renal artery stenosis. There are two main distinctions to make in primary hyperaldosteronism. Two thirds of primary hyperaldosteronism comes from a unilateral functional adrenal adenoma. The other one-third comes from bilateral adrenal hyperplasia, where both adrenal glands are making elevated aldosterone levels. It is important to distinguish between the two. So once Kahn's syndrome is suspected chemically, a CT adrenal protocol makes sense to look for an obvious adenoma. There are several additional confirmatory tests once you suspect primary hyperaldosteronism. So one is a saline load test, where IV, IV saline fluids are given, then aldosterone levels are checked. If, no, if there is no suppression, then this is consistent with some sort of primary hyperaldosteronism. Another is fludrocortisone suppression testing and also captopril suppression testing, which are used to confirm primary hyperaldosteronism. These both show no suppression of aldosterone, which is consistent with a primary hyperaldosteronism from the adrenal glands themselves. This is either unilateral or bilateral. Blood testing may also sometimes show elevated 18-hydroxycortisone levels in unilateral adrenal adenomas, but not in bilateral adrenal hyperplasia. Most will say that the best confirmatory test to determine unilateral adenoma from bilateral adrenal hyperplasia is adrenal venous sampling. If there is high aldosterone levels from only one adrenal vein, this is more indicative of an adrenal adenoma that is unilateral as opposed to bilateral adrenal vein having high aldosterone levels.
The most important difference between the two is treatment. A bilateral adrenal hyperplasia is treated medically with spironolactone, an aldosterone receptor blocker, whereas a unilateral adrenal adenoma is treated with a unilateral adrenalectomy. Next, let's talk about the zona fasciculata. The most important hormone from the zona fasciculata is cortisol. An excess level of cortisol is called Cushing syndrome and will lead to hyperglycemia, moon face, buffalo hump, purple abdominal stray. Overall, the most common cause of hypercortisolism is iatrogenic from exogenous steroid use. Primary hypercortisolism, which is from an adrenal source such as an adrenal adenoma. Secondary hypercortisolism is from a source that is producing high levels of ACTH. So let's review the hypothalamic pituitary axis. The hypothalamus in the brain makes cortisol, a releasing hormone or CRH. This stimulates the pituitary gland to create ACTH. ACTH increases cortisol secretion from the adrenal gland. If the pituitary has a growth secreting ACTH itself, this is known as Cushing's disease specifically. Ectopic ACTH comes from perineoplastic syndromes, such as from a small cell lung cancer. However, if the adrenal gland itself is secreting cortisol from an adenoma, this has a negative feedback on ACTH and will, this will result in a low ACTH level. The first test to confirm Cushing's syndrome is a 24-hour urine cortisol level, which is better than spot checks of cortisol since it has diurnal vi variations. If the 24-hour urine cortisol is high and the serum ACTH is low, this is indicative of a Cushing syndrome. You can measure ACTH in the blood, but it varies a lot from person to person and depending on the time of the day also. So usually you will be asked uh, about a confirmatory test to distinguish primary hypercortisolism from secondary hypercortisolism. Uh, this is the dexamethasone suppression test. So if the patient has a low-dose dexamethasone suppression test, this will not suppress the cortisol level in either a Cushing's disease from a pituitary source or a true Cushing's syndrome. However, a high-dose dexamethasone suppression test will suppress Cushing's disease from a pituitary source, but will not suppress the 24-hour urine cortisol from an, an adrenal source or from an ectopic ACTH. Obviously, a CT scan of the chest can be done to look for ectopic ACTH source from a lung cancer if that source is suspected. CT adrenal protocol can usually see a unilateral adrenal adenoma. The treatment for pituitary adenoma causing Cushing's disease is typically either radiation of the pituitary gland or medical treatment with bromocryptine, which is a dopamine agonist which shuts down the pituitary gland, or rarely with surgical pituitary removal. Very rarely would you need to do a bilateral adrenalectomy for secondary hypercortisolism, so don't start uh, answering any test questions with that. If the patient has a unilateral adrenal adenoma secreting cortisol, obviously the treatment then is unilateral adrenalectomy. Next, the zona reticularis is known for making the sex hormones testosterone and estrogen precursors. The main thing to know about this zone is that adenomas or adrenal cortical carcinoma can secrete some virilizing hormones. The other disorder which commonly comes up when discussing this section is congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Do not confuse this with bilateral adrenal hyperplasia. Congenital adrenal hyperplasia refers to an, an inherited enzyme deficiency, the most common being 21-hydroxylase deficiency. 21-hydroxylase deficiency leads to an imbalance of the production of testosterone and estrogen levels. This may show up as precocious puberty, virilizing symptoms in women with clitoral megaly, and ambiguous genitalia in males. Now let's move on to talk about the adrenal medulla. The adrenal medulla makes epinephrine and norepinephrine. The conversion of norepinephrine to epinephrine is via the PNMT enzyme. So if epinephrine is found to be secreted, it is usually an adrenal source of the pheochromocytoma, since this is the only place the enzyme lives. Secretion of adrenaline from the adrenal medulla is called a pheochromocytoma. If a pheochromocytoma, pheochromocytoma is outside the adrenal gland, then this is called a paraganglionoma. Uh, 
and anywhere along the sympathetic chain from the neck down through the periaortic retroperitoneum, you can find paraganglionomas. A common location for a paraganglioma is the organ of Zuckercandle, which is at the bifurcation of the aorta. Always remember that pheochromocytoma is related to genetic syndromes, the first of which is MEN2A. MEN2A consists of the three C's. One, calcitonin, which is from medullary thyroid cancer. Two, calcium, which signifies parathyroid hyperplasia. And three, catecholamines, which is from a pheochromocytoma. If you are given a pheochromocytoma on a test, always ask about family history. Other genetic problems associated with pheochromocytomas include neurofibromatosis type 1 and von Hippel-Lindau syndrome. The symptoms of pheochromocytoma and are classically remembered as the five P's. 1. Pressure, high blood pressure. 2. Palpitations, high heart rate. 3. Pain, headaches, or uh, sometimes vision changes. Perspiration, which is sweating. Panic, feelings of anxiety, and feelings of dread. The other classic uh, thing about pheochromocytomas is the rule of tens. 10% 10 are malignant, 10% are familial, 10% are bilateral, 10% are extra-adrenal, 10% are found in children, and 10% are not associated with hypertension. Biochemical testing for pheochromocytoma is 24-hour urine for VMA and metanephrines. These are epinephrine and norepinephrine breakdown products. They should be high in a pheochromocytoma. For other adrenal masses, CT scanning is pretty much all you need. For pheochromocytoma, however, imaging is a little bit more involved. A CT is probably going to be the first test you order after a biochemical suspicion of a pheo. Frequently, though, you'll be asked about MRI. MRI with T2-weighted images shows enhancement for pheochromocytomas classically. If a CT and MRI can confirm a MIBG, which stands for methiodobenzylguanidine scan, may show where the pheochromocytoma is located. This may be a good idea to get, especially in an MEN syndrome patient, since they have a higher incidence of extra adrenal pheochromocytomas. Now there's also a PET scan using special somatostatin scintigraphy. All right, now let's assume you're operating on an adrenal, pho adrenal pheochromocytoma. The preparation for surgery can be remembered as A, B, C, D. A is for alpha blockade, which is typically done either with prazosin or phenoxybenzamine. This is usually done about two weeks prior to surgery. You know if your alpha blockade is good enough when you have orthostatic hypotension and dry mucous membranes. B stands for beta blockade, which is used if there is tachycardia after sufficient alpha blockade has been reached. Never start with beta blockers because you'll have unopposed alpha blockade, which causes very severe hypertension. C stands for crystalloid, which is important to hydrate these patients well, since they are typically dehydrated, which makes surgery more difficult. And D stands for drugs, which is to remind you that it's very important to discuss the patient with your anesthesia team because they need to have medications available to rapidly alter blood pressure during surgery as these patients can become very labile. You should know how to describe both laparoscopic right and left adrenalectomies. Remember that the right adrenal gland ha has a short adrenal vein, which should be controlled early with clips, especially in a pheochromocytoma. The surrounding arterial blood supply is typically taken with energy devices since they are small branches. If you evulse the right adrenal vein during surgery and have profuse bleeding, Go ahead and proceed to open surgery re with repair of the IVC with a proline suture. The left adrenal gland sits below the pancreas and has a longer adrenal vein, which is easier to clip and divide. Let's talk a little bit about adrenal cortical carcinoma. Adrenal cortical carcinoma is commonly diagnosed on imaging as a very large adrenal mass with evidence of malignancy, such as hemorrhage and invasion of local structures. If there is suspicion for adrenal cortical carcinoma, either proceeding to surgery or confirmatory biopsy may be considered, but be sure to rule out functional problems with the adrenal gland prior to any biopsy, which we will discuss more in a moment. If adrenal cortical carcinoma is suspected, it may be associated with hormone imbalances, similar to any of the above already described. 
A typical recommendation is to do open surgery for adrenal cortical carcinoma. Even debulking surgery is useful, especially if there is hormonal excess problems related to the carcinoma. Remember that mitotain is the chemotherapy for adrenal cortical carcinoma. There is a very high recurrence rate even after curative resection for adrenal cortical carcinomas. Another important topic is the adrenal incidental mass or incidentaloma. The differential diagnosis of an adrenal mass includes an adenoma, a lipoma, a cyst, pheochromocytoma, adrenal cortical carcinoma, and metastatic lesions. You must ask if the patient has a personal history of cancer, since tumors that commonly metastasize to the adrenal include breast, lung, renal cell, and melanoma cancers. I would answer for any incidental adrenal mass that you would do biochemical testing initially. So here is a very basic testing schema. Serum test for electrolytes, aldosterone, renin, and androgen levels. Then send a 24-hour urine for cortisol, VMA, and metanephrine levels. That should be a pretty good start for most exams. The thing to know is that any adrenal mass over 4 centimeters should be removed regardless of whether it is functional or has suspic suspicious imaging characteristics. Follow masses smaller than 4 centimeters closely with serial CT scans. Needle biopsy only after ruling out pheochromocytoma with the urinary VMA and metanephrines. And you should probably biopsy any adrenal mass if the patient has a personal history of malignancy. Very last, let's briefly talk about problems with low function of the adrenal gland. Low levels of adrenal hormones leads to hypotension, hypoglycemia, electrolyte problems such as low sodium and high potassium, weight loss, and fatigue. You can have hypoadrenalism from a lack of pituitary stimulation if there is something wrong with the pituitary gland. Sheehan syndrome is postpartum pituitary hemorrhage. Primary adrenal gland failure may come from a bilateral adrenal gland hemorrhage due to sepsis, classically meningococcal, which is called waterhouse Friedrichsen syndrome. Do not forget that the most common cause of adrenal insufficiency is due to iatrogenic, due to rapid withdrawal of exogenous glucocorticoids. Addison's disease is an autoimmune problem with autoimmune destruction of the adrenal gland. This causes a decrease in function of most of the adrenal hormones. The pituitary gland increases ACTH levels to try and compensate for this, and more ACTH is produced. Part of the production of ACTH also makes melanocyte stimulating hormone or MSH. This can lead to a bronze discoloration of the skin in people who have Addison's disease. That pretty much wraps up the highlights of what you need to know about the adrenal gland. Thanks, I hope that helped.